All right, so let's continue on and talk about one of generally one of the most in, uh, confusing topic uh, for architecture, uh, the cash currency. Uh, so what is a cash currency? Let's say you have the same bush or address that you want to access, right? Whenever the core demands the data, you need to get the most updated version of the data to that core, right? But now you have multi-processor. You have multi-processor. And you have to share cache, right? That that distributed multiple core across multiple cores. Unless I have two threads, right? Two threads from the same apps, right? My bad over here. Two threads. Two thread. They want to read or write to the same cache line, right? They want to read or write to the same cache line. The data might be in a private L1 as well, right? So you might want to make sure that the data in there are coherent, right? And the question is, how do we maintain coherency across different caches? And here's, here's the situation. We have thread one on processor one. Thread two on processor two. You want to access address A. For both of both processor, right? And it's okay because it's a it's the same application, it's a shared data. They want to access address A. This is a private hour cache, right? And this is a share L2. And this is for processor one. Is for processor two. Let's say I want to access by writing, writing new value for the address A, and just say this is address A, right? This is address A. Initially, it has a value five, so address A has a value five for all uh, cache processor, right? This is address A again. This is address A. Now, thread one comes in and say, "Hey, I want to access." This address, I want to change the value to six. You update this to six. And because we use write back policy, we haven't evicted yet. We haven't evicted this yet. The problem is from processor to point of view, right? With this update, if I want to read the value of address A, what are you going to see? Again, I use write back cache. Write back cache means that I don't update the data in a lower level until I evict the cache block. And I haven't evicted the cache block. So if we see number five, right? Is that a problem? Because as you said, it reads the old value, right? So the issue here is how can I make sure that P2 is communicated and say, hey, the number is actually six which is from this guy, right? So that's a problem. We need to maintain coherency across all the different caches. So when you have multi-core processor, the main issue is how do we get coherency up, right? The high level idea is this. It's actually, think about it this way. If the data is in read only, if no one, if no one modify the data yet, everyone can access the data and it's fine. So that's the first thing. High level idea, if no one modify the data yet, everyone can access the data. If someone write, if someone write to the cache line, if someone write to the cache line, we modify the status of that cache line. We modify the status of that cache line depending on who else might need the data. If you are the if you are the only one who has the data, it's fine, right? You just update, keep updating, it's fine. If someone else might need the data, you need to make sure that core, that core, got the notification that say, hey someone re-modify the data, so you better get the correct version of the data. This is called the cache coherence protocol. 
is a protocol to ensure that if someone modified the data, everyone is notified of that. Everyone is aware that someone else modified the data. Now, the high level, I guess, simple, right? If someone modified the data, everyone has to be acknowledged that say, hey, there's new data out there. The goal is how can we play this game without communication cost? How can we minimize the communication and the data transfer? How can we play this game of cache coherence protocol in a, in a way that you limit the number of talking between each processor and the number of data transfer between each processor because that worsen that that decrease the performance right so coherency 101 the simplest thing you can do if you have writes to the data block you invalidate the block meaning that if someone else modify your data you have to invalidate that block and don't use it it's as simple as that hello idea if i can detect that someone modify my data i will invalidate I will basically go and invalidate my data because it's not updated anymore. Now, the issue is how can I know someone else write to it? How can I know someone else write to it? The CPU has this bus. We call this a Snoopy bus. The reason why we call it Snoopy bus because the only thing it does is it snoop around and say, hey, have anyone update or invalidate my data? And if it does, yeah, you can invalidate my block as well. The processor would observe this. The other processor would tell the action that I'm doing. I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm writing. If it detects that the other processor is writing, then it's time to invalidate. And so you can visualize it this way, right? This is the bus, right? And this is again address A with the value five, right? And now the first thing that happened, processor one load A, right? A got to here address five. When processor one load A, notice that is the only cache block with the correct value with the correct value, right? Then it followed by processor one modified A. How about this, modify A to six. This get changed to six. Is there any problem here? Is there any problem? Can I keep going without telling anyone else that, hey, I modify A? So one safe thing that I need to do is to tell this L2 cache that someone modify this, right? Someone modify it. Why? It basically tell that, hey, the number five is not the most updated number. If you want to read from it, if you want to read from it, you need to get this value six from processor one's cache, right? So. In that case, if processor two want to load A, you would basically need to put this here, update the value to six, and then put the value six here, right? So that's the first thing that can happen. Processor one load A modifier and someone else want to use the data. How about this? So that's scenario one. Let's say, let's, let's go with scenario number two. I have address B, right? I have address B and then processor one, load B, followed by processor two, load B, followed by processor one, uh, right, oops, sorry, right, to B, 
followed by processor to load B. Right, a little bit different. Now both processor has the data first, right? So address B is here. Let's say the address B has a value. Uh, can someone give me a number? Uh, let's say it has a value four, right? So pro processor one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> processor one load B, right? So four. Uh, both in the other. Uh, both processor now have the number four. And then processor one say, hey, I want to modify this. I want to modify four and rewrite them into a different number, right? Let's say I want to rewrite this to six, right? When I write this to six, it also has to notify B here that, hey, the number is modified. So that this gets invalidated, right? Invalidated. So that if I need to access processor, uh, processor two, let's say it has to access B, it would try to get the data from here all the way to here, right? So that, that's actually the protocol. We want to make sure there's a protocol in place to tell where to get the data from and how do I load them, all right? So one of the basic protocols is called MSI protocol. Uh, it was proposed quite a while ago, but it's as simple as this. Each cache block, right? Each cache block would maintain three states. Modify, share, invalid. Modify means that this is the only copy and the block is dirty. It means that it's a dirty block. So if someone evict this block, rewrite that into the new data is written to the, the lower level, uh, the upper level cache. Basically, if someone owns the block and modify the data. Share means that there can be multiple copies or one. Basically, I might be the only ownership or it might be shared across multiple processor. Invalid means that the cache line is not there. It's invalidated. Whatever data is there is either not there or old data that need to be updated. When you have a read mess, you send a request and you transition yourself to S. You have the write mess, you send read exclusive, means that I am in the modified state. Everyone else is invalidated, right? Everyone else, so in this case, everyone else has to be invalidated because I modify the data. No one has the updated data myself turns to M, right? This is basically myself turn to S. If the processor C read exclusive on the Snoopy bus, if the processor C read exclusive on a Snoopy bus, the only thing that, that can happen, it means that someone is writing my data, so I I invalidate my copy. The transition from share to modify can be done without reading the data from the memory, right? So I modify by having write miss. I update my data. I transition from S to M. And I don't have to inform anyone else except for I send a read exclusive request so that everyone else invalidate their copy. So that's the MSI protocol. The problem is this. When you have a read, it goes directly to share, even though you might be the only one with the data, right? But this can be done without notifying everyone else, right? So you can reduce communication when you are the only one with the block. I mean, you don't have to tell anyone else what you did with that, right? If everyone else doesn't have the data, just update, modify, update is fine, right? So you can have the additional state called exclusive 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 is i have the only copy and i have not modified this only copy not right to it yet this is the only copy 
but I have written on it. I have written on that block. So I modify the data. Everyone else has to invalidate. If I'm in the exclusive state, I just read the data and haven't done anything to that block. Right? I haven't done anything to that block. The rest looks the same. Now, when you transition from E to M, when you modify the data, this can be done silently because it's guaranteed that no one else has to be informed. So you reduce the 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 uh, the overhead this way, right? So here's a protocol uh, between read versus write. So write modify the data. So read need to get the correct most updated copy, and key issue is this: I need to be able to propagate the updated data to all the reader through the flush operation. I also need to minimize communication because it slows things down and only update if you need to, because that also slows things down. So to do this, the MBSI protocol, right? When you have a cache state, it has two things. I can read a write to the cache block. And what does the share bus observe? based on the read of write to that cache block. Cache block, CB is cache block, A is the address. So, oh, my bad. Let's say I am in the modified state. I'm in the modified state. Modified state means that the block is dirty and I'm the only one that has the block, right? I'm the only one that has the block. If I read, I stay in modified because that's basically the only thing I have to do. I don't have to tell anyone else if I read on the modify. If I write to it again, right? Because I am the only one with the block, I stay there and I am in the modified state. If I, I have the only one, I am the only one who has the data and I have a read, I stay there. I stay there. If I am in the exclusive state, and I write to the data. I also stay there. Right, and I can do this silently. If I'm in a share state, if I'm in the share state and I write to the data. I go to modify. Then. The red text means I have to inform anyone else that I'm writing. The red thing is that I am red means I'm sending the message through the bus. The red text means I'm sending the message. I'm writing. If I'm in the read state, uh, if I'm in the share state and I do the read, I stay there. If I'm in the invalidate state and I read and I read, I go to share. I go to share. If I'm in an invalidated state, if I'm in the invalidated state and I write, and I write. And I am writing, I go to modify. And then again, I have to tell everyone else I'm writing. Now, whenever I use the red arrow, it means that I observe someone else's writing. If I observe someone else's writing to that block of data and I'm in the exclusive state, I go directly to invalidate. If I'm in the modified state and someone else is writing, it's a cache mess writing to that block. Again, I'm going to the exclusive uh, invalidated state. Observe. Writing. If I'm in a shared state, someone else modified my data, I invalidate myself, right? And then the last thing, right? The last thing is if I am in the invalid state and I'm reading, 
I'm reading. One thing that can happen is someone else might be in a shared state. Or someone else might be in an exclusive state. I have the only copy. I have the only copy. I can also be in the modified state, right? Basically, whenever I read that block, I'm in the shared state. But whoever owns the block, I need to send the fact that I'm reading. Uh, let's, let's use a different text color. I will send the yellow, uh, the, the orange signal that I'm reading. Whenever someone see the reading signal, this is what I should do. If I'm in the exclusive state, it means that someone else now shared the data. So I go to the share state. Observe reading. If I'm in the invalidated state, I mean, I don't own the data, so I stay there, right? Observe reading. If I'm in a modifier state, I in am um, in a share state, right? If I observe reading. And if I'm in a share state, no one modify my data, so I stay in a uh, share state. So this is how you can maintain a proper protocol, right? And you will notice that if you are in the exclusive state, you don't have to send any signal to anyone. You don't have to send any signal to anyone. If you're in the modified state, if you're in the modified state, you can read or write to it, to the, the, to, to the text block, right? That guarantee everyone else is invalidated, so you can keep that doing that silently. It only when you have to move from exclusive status to non-exclusive status, right? And one more overhead that you have to do is if you are in the modified state and you detect that someone else is reading, of writing. If it's writing, you just throw away the data because it's not valid anymore. Someone overwrite the data. If you observe someone reading, if you observe someone reading, which is this one specific case, you perform the write back. This blue part means that I have the most updated version of the data. So everyone else, please take this new updated data by I will just perform the write back. The, low, uh, the upper level cache will see the updated data. Now someone else who wants to read it will actually can successfully read them. Now they can successfully read them, right? So that's the MBSI protocol, right? And you can now visualize that the write back that I just showed earlier. Oh, ah, great question, great question. Does the color happen in parallel or in sequence? It has to happen in sequence. It it trigger it trigger with the action from the processor. For example, if I am in the invalid state, processor say I want to load this data. The the triggering part is the the load stuff, right? I want to read. Oh, I want to write. So the green thing is the first that happened. The green thing is the first that happened. Then it would generate a signal. It can be the writing signal, which is the red red signal. It can be the reading signal, which is the orange signal. Then based on the signal, the other cache block will listen to the signal. It can be the red thing or the orange thing, and it transition itself into a different state. And if you happen to transition from M to S, then you perform a write back. So basically the green stuff followed by the orange or red, depending on whether you're doing read or write, followed by the last thing, if you have to move from M to S, you have to write back. And this will guarantee that you have the, the, the correct uh, uh, sequence of updates to maintain the correct data. So again, the green stuff followed by the orange or red, followed by just doing the action, the, 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 the uh, blue. All right, so let's visualize this a little bit, right? So earlier you have this address A, 
right? With the value five, address A with the value five, right? You are in a share state, you're in a share state because I mean, both of them have the valid copy. Now I write to that, processor one write to it, right? This is what happened. I overwrite five change to six. This becomes modify. I am the only owner of that copy, right? This one becomes invalidated because I don't have that copy anymore. Whatever I see here, five is not valid. Now, what happens next? Let's say a processor to want to read from it, processor who want to read from this. I transition from invalidate to share again because someone is in modify, right? I read from that. This becomes share. You need to do the write back putting the value six here and transfer the value six there so that this has the value six, this has the value six. So this is the protocol basically. All right, now we do have an example from last year exam uh, on your web, uh, on the class website, you can see F20 is actually from two years ago. Uh, there's a question for cache coherence. As you can see here, we will not do the example here right now. Uh, Let's treat this as like a take home exercise. We'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about this, about the solution to this question uh, once we're back next week. All right, so we'll talk about this next week, followed by going over the exam next week, right? This is on the class website already. So if you go to the class website here, you should see all the lecture, right, as I show here. And now you should see the Comarch final uh, F20. That's a sample final for everyone here as well, in case you want to kind of study for your final. All right. Uh, oops. Uh, now let's move on, right? Because it's not done. Coherency is not is a, is a complex topic. Because a Snoopy bus where you send the I write, I read, I write, I read. It doesn't scale, right? As you have more core, you cannot have all the eight or 16 or 32 processors sharing this one single bus. So there's another idea to use the central directory to keep track of the copies in the cache block, right? And this, we have a simple policy. For each cache block, you store n plus one bit one bit per local cache. When it's one, it means that I have to block in the cache. If it's a zero, it means I don't have to block in the cache. And one exclusive bit. If that bit is one, it means that there's only one owner. If I have to read, I set the bit. If I have to write, I invalidate the entire block, basically reset, everything becomes zero, and I'm the only owner. So I still have the exclusive bit set. And the cache can update silently if the exclusive bit is set. So that's a directory protocol. That's a directory based protocol. All right. So now that's about cache coherence. The next thing we have to talk about is data consistency or memory consistency. Right. When you look at memory consistency, what it means is when you have multiple applications, they can share the data, which means that it need to maintain the order of read and writes to DRAM. And it's specified by the ISA. ISA will have the, the specification on how consistency works. This allows the programmer to see the expected order of things that happen. So let's say you have one single processor, this is simple. Just follow the follow the assembly code line by line. It's a simple von Neumann model. In the data flow model, uh, dependency would determine ordering. Now I talk about the single core. What about multi-core? You have multiple threads that want to update the data concurrently together at the same time. They have to be protected by critical in a critical section like lock, semaphore, and conditional variable. Right? These are the synchronization construct from the programmer point of view to protect your critical section. Then in the hardware, because you run things out of order, you run things out of order. 
you need to make sure that you provide the correct execution based on this synchronization primitive like locks semaphore conditional variable. So basically, you have the locks in the software. The programmer writes the locks properly to utilize parallel programming. The hardware needs to follow that locks. The hardware has to make sure whatever programmer is writing holds true holds true, assuming that the programmer put in proper locks and semaphore and conditional variable. To do that, you need to, well, look at sequential consistency. This is defined by Leslie Lamport. Uh, the paper talks about how to make a multiprocessor computer that correctly executes multiprocess program. Basically, how to make a functional multiprocessor. All right, that's 1979. Uh, the, the, the idea is a multiprocessor is sequentially consistent is if the result of any execution is the same as if the operation of all the processor were executed in some sequential order, not on some sequential order, and the operation of each individual processor appear in this sequence in the order specified by the program. This is called the memory ordering model specified by the ISA. Basically, if, if a processor executes the code, it's supposed to execute the code in the same order as specified by the program, as if they're specified by the program. And is execute that that operations in some sequence in some sequence. So let's say you have four operation A, B, C, and D. You have four operation A, B, C, and D. Any permutation can be correct global ordering A, B, C, D, A, C, B, D, C, A, B, D, D, A, C, B, right? These are the legit global ordering. Because the actual order can depend on implementation or dynamic uh, latency, but but here's what is uh, to be consistent is all oops all cores need to observe the same global ordering. So basically, every single core need to observe whatever permutation happened, and it, it all of them should observe the same sequences. The benefit is now all processors see the same global ordering, so you don't have correctness issue. However, when you have multiple ex like multiple execution of the program, a different global ordering can happen. It, it, it would make it really difficult to debug. Let's say you run the program twice, you check your lock, the program looks normal, hardware bugs. It's somehow not sequentially consistent, right? What else? The downside is global ordering is a strong guarantee, right? Because in many cases, you don't always need global ordering. Because the critical section, right, that has to obey global ordering only is important if someone actually modified the data. If I read the data only, if I keep reading, 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 I don't care what order I see because no one modified the data, right? So one idea is what if you apply global ordering across all the store? So this is called a total store order memory model. You can also enforce global ordering only at boundary between writes so that it makes sure the program enter and exit the critical section. Uh, with global ordering through the relaxed consistency model. So here's a weak consistency model. The ordering is important when the operation affects, only when the operation affects the shared data, which means that I write to the shared data. So 
the programmer can specify the non-share region. This is done through memory fence, right? The memory operation before the fence must complete before it arrives at the fence. And memory operation after the fence must wait. Must wait. For the fence to complete and the fence complete in program order. This allows synchronization to uh, the operation to synchronize acts like a fence. Downside, as a programmer, you still need to carefully program this and need to make sure it is correct. So the benefit of the consistency model is actually this is faster, right? You don't have to apply all this like the fence. I mean, you don't have to apply global ordering every time. You just need to rely on the programmer to actually put in the memory fence to make sure that the ordering apply, right? Uh, quick thing, uh, before we leave today, we are not going through the midterm, uh, not enough time, but don't forget that we have the sample hash currency questions here on the uh, on Canvas. So please don't forget to do that. Uh, what else? Uh, that's it for the lecture part today. So let me stop the recording.